Alright, again, welcome to Berean Bible Fellowship. Uh, this is April 8, 2018, and the title of today's sermon is Your Reasonable Service. Now, I have spent my entire adult life in the service industry. My very first job was at the Red Lobster when I was 16 years old. You know, my, uh, I went then and served in the United States Marine Corps for uh, six years. After that, I spent 14 years as a Xerox technician. So I've spent my entire adult life, and now I'm a nurse and a pastor, so I've spent my entire life ser serving others and, ser and serving God. You know, you have to wonder, what is the level of expectation that people have upon your service? You know, when I was at the Red Lobster, we got training, and we knew exactly what to do as a busboy. We had to go clean the tables up. And if you didn't, then you weren't doing your job. You weren't doing proper service. When I was in the Marine Corps, I served this country. Uh, you know, went to many different countries and had different conflicts going on. And, and fixed laser optical equipment. From there, I came out and worked for Xerox for 14 years. And now a nurse and a pastor. But where I find myself presently is where I find true joy and satisfaction, and that is in service to the Lord in this church as pastor and teacher. In today's sermon, we're going to examine our service unto the Lord. We will look at the decline in the standards of service and how it has affected our service unto the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I worked for Xerox for 14 years. Now Xerox was a company that led the industry in customer service that it delivered. I attended many classes with men to train us how to treat people, how to properly service people. And we established a high level of customer service. We were actually the benchmark that people measured themselves against. What is God's? Because God is the benchmark. What is His benchmark? What is His expectation of, of our service? Now those of you who know me know that I have an ongoing battle with McDonald's. <laughs> My wife likes her McDonald's coffee and I like McDonald's tea. Every morning we go and we get our tea and our coffee. And McDonald's refuses to put the tea bag in my tea. They've given me such excuses as it's a health code violation. We're not allowed to do so. And it got to a point where my wife forbade me from complaining about it. She said, somebody's going to spit in your tea or do something to it and yeah. stop complaining. Yeah. <laughs> so what I did is I lowered my, my expectations of the standard that I expected. And my wife said, I will put your tea bag in. You know, many of us do that with our service to the Lord. We come out and have high expectations and understanding of the high expectation that God puts on us. But as we interact with other people and we people aren't reaching that level of expectation, we lower our standards. We, we lower the standard of the service that we perform, that we offer. And that's what happened uh, last Friday. I think it was Friday or Thursday. We went up. And there was a new employee at the, through the drive-thru, and I ordered my tea, and I ordered my wife's coffee. My wife's coffee came out, as it usually does, and my tea came out with the bag on the side and the sugar on the side, to where I sat there and just sh shook my head. And the girl asked, is there a problem? It asked me with attitude, is there a problem? I said, yes, I don't feel that I should have to mix my tea in the drive-thru. I order, I've paid for this. If I want it, if I want to make it myself, I'll do it at home. I ex my expectation is when I order tea for it to be prepared. They didn't send my wife's coffee out with coffee grounds and sugar on the side. So why are they sub submitting me to this torture? 
and anybody, as I said, who's around me after this happens, they're being tortured by my mouth because I won't shut up about it. I actually called the manager there Thursday morning and, and bent his ear for a half an hour. But this annoying situation has caused me to examine my service to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's God telling us that these sacrifices, and what is he expecting? It is your reasonable service. It's reasonable for me to expect my tea to be made. Is it, is it unreasonable? So God tells you what he feels is reasonable. And he breaks it down into three parts in that verse. First, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Two, be holy. Three, be acceptable to God. So we're going to talk about each one of those and break those down. So presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, does God mean that we need to go to the altar and place our necks there? Not quite. It's not what he's talking about. We as descendants of Adam were born into sin. In Psalms 51, 5, King David writes, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in, my, in sin did my mother conceive me. So what he's telling you there is right from the beginning, you were conceived in sin and you were condemned. So it didn't matter that you had not even taken a step here on this earth yet. You were born under Adam and into condemnation. So many people think, you know, that I've, I'm such a horrible person. I've done so many bad things that I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve God's mercy. Let me, uh, let me uh, confirm that for you. You don't. None of, us can, none of us deserve God's mercy. God has two things. And I, I'm, I'm going to save that for the end. I'll save that for the end. But none of us deserve His mercy. We're all born condemned. We're all born needing a Savior. So, but in the body of Christ, we have found redemption from sin. Jesus Christ purchases with his blood on the cross at Golgotha. Amen. We belong to him. Back when they had these, uh, the African Americans were in slavery, they had the slave market. And people would come in and purchase slaves. And it took a free man in order to come in and purchase a slave. I, as a slave, could not go in and say, well, this is my wife. I want to purchase her. I would have had to have someone grant me my freedom first and go in as a free man. And this is what happened with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into the slave market of sin, but he came in as a free man, one who was free from sin. Now, why was Jesus born free from sin, but we're not? Jesus Christ had no earthly father. The, the, the Virgin Mary was a virgin. She did not know a man. And the sin nature is passed on through the father of the race. From father to son, from father to daughter. That is how the sin goes on. And that is how each and every one of us are born condemned. But Jesus Christ was different. He didn't have an earthly father. So he had no sin nature passed on to him. Then on top of that, he did not commit any personal sin while here on earth. Amen. He fulfilled the Mosaic Law. He lived the 613 laws of the Mosaic Law. He fulfilled it. He did not break one of them. So this qualified him to come into the slave market of sin and purchase us. And by his blood we are redeemed. So by him and by his actions we are saved. We are cleaned. So, it is his reasonable expectation that we deny ourselves of a sinful lifestyle. And that's what, he, that's what he's talking about, presenting our bodies 
as a, as a living sacrifice. Now, we still have an old sin nature, even though you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which is necessary for salvation. Even though you do that, you still have an old sin nature. You still have that because it is genetically in you. But God's, uh, Jesus Christ's death creates a new man in you. So God is dealing with the new man. Your old sin nature is in your flesh, which is dead, in a, according to God. It has been buried in the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, your sin got nailed to that cross and buried with him. So that when you sin, it doesn't go to that new man. It goes to the flesh. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, it does. But it is God's reasonable expectation that we live a life following after him and, and allowing to be changed by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in, like coming into a new house, my wife and I are now looking for a house. When we get that house, the first thing my wife is going to do is she's going to go in and she's going to clean that house out. <laughs> As she's done with every other house that we've had. She's going to clean out all the cobwebs and all the dust and dirt, and she's going to make sure that it's nice and fresh and new, and smelling clean. The Holy Spirit wants to do that with you. He wants to make sure that He comes in and we sweep out all the mess, all the bad habits. But you've got to allow that change. Amen. You, it, it tells us don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't block what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in you. Amen. He's trying to produce the change in you, and He's trying to conform you to walk in a way that is acceptable to Him. Amen. That is the, the, that is the benchmark, Amen. the standard. Now, like the McDonald's worker who was too lazy to put the tea bag in my tea, the incorrect practice becomes a practice, and then it becomes a norm. See, because I used to fight him about this. We lived out in Fayetteville. I got those people trained. They, they, they knew when I was coming through the window, you better put that heat bag on, he'll curse you up. <laughs> okay, I made this one boy so nervous one time, he sat there. <laughs> but when we allow a, 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 a bad practice, when we allow it, when we accept it, you know, they say when you, you take an inch, you give them an inch, they'll take a yard. Yeah. And that's what happens with sin also. When you allow sin to exist in your life, it's not going to be occasional. It's going to start becoming habitual. And then you get off God's path, and then you stay off God's path. You get comfortable with that sin. Like the homosexual who once found shame in their sinful practice now finds acceptance in a culture who seeks not to please God the Almighty. Our culture has accepted certain practices, even though they know it goes against the Word of God. And the more acceptable it becomes, I told you guys to sell this earphone, I forgot to sign on this money. <laughs> um, here we go. All right. So, um, as I said, with many practices, that have uh, that that we do, the culture accepts them. Have you noticed that it seems like there's a lot more of that going on right now? Yeah. And you ask yourself, is it is it a, is it a lot more going on, or is it just that we have a lot more access, so we now know everybody who's doing something? And I think it's a little bit of both. I think you know you have the access, so people see it, and they're like, oh, you know, everybody's doing it. It's okay for me to do it too. We stop using God as a standard. We stop using Him as a benchmark. We as Christians and members of the body should evaluate our lives and look for areas that are in conflict with God's ways. You know, as a nurse, we're told to do assessments and reassessments. After you do something, you know, you wait a little while, then you go back again and you know, look at it again under new eyes and you see, is it, is it the same? Is there a way for me to improve? Have you looked at your life and seen what sin is in there and seen, you know what, let me deal with this? Because it's going to change you. It's going to change how God is able to interact with you. 
we, don't, we shouldn't just sit on sin in our life and say, well, you know, it's okay. I, I, I can't do anything about it. No, we can. God has given you provision. Provision to live a holy life. Amen. Yes, he has. So when you live in the pigsty of sin long enough, you get comfortable in your sinful way. You know, when the pigs, they get down in the mud. When you take them out of that mud, they're lost. They, 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 they want to go back and want to look for the mud again, because that's where they're comfortable. We can't allow ourselves to be so comfortable with the pigsty. And that's what this world is. It's a pigsty. It is not honoring to God. And we, sh we should not be comfortable in it. So as you continue in sin and move away from God, you forget that the mud is not your bed. It's not where God wants you. God wants a holy, acceptable life for you. God wants joy for you. You know what the difference between joy and happiness is? Your happiness can be affected by things outside. You know, my wife and I, if uh, the occasional times that we fight, <laughs> that, rare, takes, rare, rare occasion. <laughs> that takes away from my happiness. Because I like to please my wife. I like my wife to be happy. I like to be happy. But it doesn't affect my joy. My joy is eternal. My joy is from within. My joy is in the Lord. So no matter what goes on around me, that I need a, I need a place to live, I, you know, uh, my boss is on me at work, I have the joy of the Lord inside me. That is eternal. Amen. Amen. So this is reasonable that God expects, expects us to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. He is to lead us and guide us to all truth. So God expects us to positively respond to the, to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He's, call, he's constantly calling you, telling you, come on this way. Come on over to Bible study. Amen. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. You know, I talk about relationships. <laughs> Women, how would you how would you feel if your husband, your boyfriend, came and said, uh, honey, we're only gonna spend an hour together this week. Just an hour. The rest of the time, don't bother. Okay? It's for something else. She just said she won't fight with you as much. <laughs> 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 Would most people be satisfied with that? Uh, yeah, I know that all the men. Yeah, I'm never happy with that. <laughs> Would you ladies be happy with that? Would you consider that to be a healthy relationship? No. When you're in a relationship with somebody, you want to spend time with them. You want to get to know them. You want to know what is your favorite color. Women want to know things that men don't want to tell them. <laughs> okay? But in a relationship, it, it requires that you spend time together. We're not in a religion. We are in a relationship with our Lord and Savior. He desires to know you. He desires to spend time with you. He wants you to get into His Word to know what His expectations are of you. You know, God addresses many different relationships. He tells wives, respect your husbands. He tells husbands, love your wives. He tells children, respect your parents. This is your reasonable service. It is reasonable. And it is reasonable and it is healthy. And it's going to bring about happiness and joy. Amen? Amen? So, for as much as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In times past, they were led by the law of Moses. But if ye be led by of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. 
We are not led by the Mosaic Law as Israel once was. We have the blessing of the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. And He will let us know what we need to do to make ourselves a living sacrifice unto Him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. The second thing was be holy. Now what does the word holy mean? The word holy means to be separate. To separate away. To be separated away for a special purpose. When I was working for Xerox, as I said, we were the benchmark. We sat above everybody else. You know, when my, when my wife first came to this country and I told her I'd gotten a job at Xerox, she thought every copier, and many people thought this, many people thought this, that every copier was a Xerox. They started calling copiers a Xerox machine, even though it was Sharp or some other company, but they called it a Xerox because we were so far above and beyond everybody else, we were separate. We were, we were a company of our own. Everybody else was over here. We were here. And that's what God wants for you. He wants you over here, away from the world, away from the pigsty. He wants you separated away for a purpose, a purpose in Him. So this means that we, as we were the standard that everybody else would measure themselves against. As such, we, we were set apart. This was the demand of Xerox. They demanded it. They had customer service surveys, and you had to get so many, uh, so much percentage, or you didn't get bonuses and all other kind of things. But God demands, as I said, for us to be holy. God has commanded us to stop the practices of the world that we that we did before we were saved. You shouldn't be comfortable doing the same things that you were doing before you were saved. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, Paul instructs the saints at Corinth, As such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It is God's will that we should walk in the way of the Lord, and in order to do this, we must be willing to hear His voice. Now, in times past, men heard the audible voice of the Lord. Moses spoke face to face with the Lord in the wilderness. The Lord and they were, they were sustained by the Lord with manna from heaven the 40 years that they, that they walked in the desert. All of this physical manifestation of God that was promised. But now, God speaks through His Word. Do you remember uh, Oral Roberts? Oh, yeah. Oral Roberts said that he woke up one night and there was a 300-foot Jesus at his bed, at his, the end of his bed. And that this 300-foot Jesus told him he had to raise, I think it was $30 million or $300 million, or he was going to kill him. <laughs> when you understand God's Word, when you apply God's Word to when you rightly divide God's word, you understand that that is not how God speaks to us nowadays. Right. Yes. The only thing that tells me is Oral Roberts' bed is too big. Right. <laughs> He's got a 300 foot Jesus at the end of it. But how can we know his word unless we study his word? When was the last time you picked up a Bible at home? <laughs> Is serving God and studying His Word a priority? When we set our minds on things that are of Christ only, then can you separate yourselves from the world. When you start serving God and start pushing out things from the world, you make more room for God to fill you up with things of Him. Amen. You can't serve, you cannot serve two masters. Either you will go to one and shut and stay away from the other. You're, you're not, you're not, you can't serve both. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, 5 reads, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of conspicuousness, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. 
So we must make sure that we are holy and separate. And as I said before, search out your life and find out what sin is there and deal with it. Don't allow it to stay in fester. Just like a seed that you plant, if you water it, it's going to grow. You water your sin nature, it's going to grow. Yeah. Lastly, we have being acceptable to God. This last section is where we must apply what we've learned. Many Christians read their Bibles, but how do they read them? Do you hurriedly scan over the scriptures barely understanding what you've read? Do you occasionally pick up the Bible and randomly pick up a chapter in it? Or, like food, do you daily intake God's Word, feeding the spiritual man? Amen. God communicates His expectations to us. In 2 Timothy 2.15 it reads, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. In commanding us to study, God wants you to, con to consume His word daily. We are to ingest it like food and make it as important as the air that we breathe. Psalms 138.2 tells us how God prioritizes His work. And it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy own name. So God puts the scriptures above His own name. That's the priority that he puts on it. His word is truth, and we should, change, we should be changed by it, not try to change it. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Not deciding what part of the Bible is edible for consumption. How dare they, those that, that believe that some parts of the Bible are true and some are not? Mm -hmm. Who are we to decide which part of God's truth is truth? That's arrogance. Yes. But many do it. Okay. Lastly, we are commanded to rightly divide His Word. We must distinguish what is written for us and what is written to us. Paul in several places states that we are no longer under the, Mosaic, the law of Moses. Yet many would bind us with the yoke never fitted for us. We are guided by a different apostle, a different set of standards. Roman 2.16 is the rubric in of, our, of our course of study. Now those of you who have been to college, many here have been to college, you know what a rubric is. Rubric is the, the standard which you're going to be graded by. You go into class and you say, well, I'm an A student. That's what I did when I went to OCC. I would start my conversation off with every one of my uh, professors. I would tell them, I am an A student. I wanted to plant that in their mind. <laughs> and then they would hand me the rubric and say, okay, A student, this is what you need to get in A. You need to make sure you're here every day. You need to get this kind of score on your essays. You need to make sure to turn all your homework in. That's the standard that you're judged by. God gave Paul the standard that we're going to be judged by. Now, if you are a Christian, and if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He died on the, that He is, is God, that He died on the cross, that He spent three days in the grave, and that He was resurrected on the third day, that is Paul's gospel. That is the gospel that saves us during this time period. Not being a good person, not inviting Jesus Christ into your heart, not repenting, not doing anything that can, is a focus on you. Only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the work that Jesus Christ did. And Jesus Christ, He did all the work. He receives all the credit. Amen. There's nothing that we can do to deserve what God is, God's mercy. Amen. That is called God's grace. What is the difference between grace and mercy? This is what I was going to say for later. <laughs> What is the difference between grace and mercy? Grace. grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. I always get that backwards. Yes, giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. 
Because each and every one of us deserve to burn in hell. Because we are sinful. Not only were we born in sin, we were pretty good at committing our daily sins. Okay, each and every one of us. So we don't deserve God's mercy. But He applies it anyway. And He gives us grace. All we have to do is believe. So Paul's gospel will be the standard at, at the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved, when the rapture occurs, the first thing that happens is you're caught up in the air, you go to the judgment seat of Christ, where you wouldn't be there unless you're saved, and it is your service, your reasonable service, that goes to, that's going to be judged. And what will be the rubric? What will be the standard? Romans 2.16 where it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So it is Paul's gospel that will be the rubric. It will be the, the epistles that Paul wrote that teach us how to walk in Christ. Not the Mosaic law that was for the Jew to guide them. But Paul's gospel. That is what guides us. Amen? Amen. Amen. His, his gospel contains the instructions to receive our reward in heaven. And if we spend time in the Mosaic Law and using that for guidance, that will burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. Sure. It will be of no use, no value. Paul's letters are the guide to how to live a life pleasing to God. Amen? Amen. All right. So understand that if you keep, keep the entire Mosaic Law... And you would, you would still not be acceptable to God. Yeah. People have a difficult time understanding that. Like, well, God put it in the Bible, so how could it be not acceptable? Because it was for a different time period, a different program. So you have to, you have to read, you have to learn to read your mail instead of someone else's mail. Because our mail says, for grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Only by believing in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I say that over and over. It's like a commercial. I want, I want it to be repetitive. Repetitive. So you walk out of here and you understand it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yes, it is. Amen. So, so are you saved? If the rapture happens today... Do you have the blessed assurance that you will be among that number? Oh, yes. yes. Are you depending on the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior to ensure you a place in heaven? Or are you hoping in your religion, in your works, that they'll make you acceptable unto God? In our uh, brochures... Before, before you... You go any further, can you explain that how sin came into the world through Adam? Sure. And then the child sure. was taken out of the world? Yep. How did sin come into the world? God created Adam from the dust of the ground, formed his body, and breathed life into him. Then he took from Adam's rib Eve, and then he placed them in a perfect environment where they were given the rights to eat of any tree of the garden except one, except the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what was it that God did not want us to have? God did not want us to have a knowledge of evil. He only wanted us to know what was good. You know, many people ask the question, how can God allow earthquakes and tornadoes and child molesters. How can, how can a loving God allow all these things? God didn't want us to know evil. He never desired that we know evil. He only wanted us to know good. And Adam and Eve made a choice. Satan, through the serpent, told Eve that if she ate of the, ate of the fruit, that her eyes would be opened and she would be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And first, he told her, he said, he, he asked what would happen if, if she ate that. And she said, well, we were told that the day that we eat of this fruit, we shall die. 
that we are not even to touch it. She added her little bit of understanding, which was not accurate. But Satan mixed truth with lie. And that is what's happening today. You get truth mixed with lie. You get a lot of religion and a lot of guys on TV preaching and everything else. And, but the message that they're preaching is incorrect. It sounds real good. It sounds it's it's come they're, they're talking a lot of stuff from the Bible. But when they get to the when they get to the gospel, what do they tell you? Invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Repent of your sins. Anything that they tell you that you can see that the focus is on you, on something you're doing, it is incorrect. In believing in Jesus Christ, you're believing in what he did. He is the focus. Anything else, you're focusing on yourself. And you cannot mix law uh, works with grace. Because when you mix uh, works with grace, grace is no longer grace. So, when they ate of the apple and they disobeyed God, sin entered the world. And that, that original sin is passed on through Adam to each and every human being on the earth, except Jesus Christ, because he did not come in the world under Adam. He came in through Mary. Now you're saying, okay, women have an old sin nature. How come it didn't pass on there? Right? I saw that question. <laughs> what, women sin? <laughs> women sin, but women do not pass on the old sin nature. What happens to women every month? Special period. They ovulate. And through that, they throw off their old sin nature. And what is created are eggs that are clean of the old sin nature. And then a man comes into the picture, and then they're, they're reinfected in, 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 uh, in the birth. So God has hit, had his plan, and he said that he would come through the seed of the woman. So meaning that no man would be involved. And... That is how sin entered the world. Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Being separ separated from his, his Father and the Holy Spirit for a three, per three hour period where the sins of the world were imputed upon him. It's a legal, a legal, it was a, it's a legal matter. He came in and the sins were imputed to him. He took the punishment for them. The punishment of sin is death. So Jesus Christ died and thus paid for the sins of the world. Now, since the sins of the world are paid, will God judge anyone for their sins? This is another fallacy. Everybody tells you, oh, you're going to be judged for your sins. Sin, is, sin has exited the world, the punishment of it. You will be judged because you stand before the Almighty on your works. If you do not have Christ, if you are not in Christ, then you will be judged on your works and you will come up lacking. Mm -hmm. Come up lacking. All right. So go ahead, uh, close up the prayer, Mike. Just take a moment to bow our heads. And uh, while we're bowing our heads, we want to make sure that we understand very clearly what the gospel is. The gospel is that, that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead, the resurrection. God's asking you to believe three things. That Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead. You can't earn it, you can't deserve it, you can't work for it. God has done all the work. He's simply asking you to believe on his son. Will you believe on his son and know that your sins are cleansed and forgiven? You can know for sure that you have a relationship with God today simply by believing in His Son. Simply by believing. So we're going to bow our heads, and we're going to give you an opportunity right now to have a conversation with God privately between you and Him, and simply tell God that you believe in His Son. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved here, today, right now. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pray. Father God, we just take this moment now to privately talk to you. Here we are collectively together as a group, but we're speaking from our hearts privately to you. And we've heard the message today. 
that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, that he was buried according to the scripture, according to the Bible, and that he rose again from the dead on the third day. And Father, we acknowledge that before you right now, we are, we are accepting your son. We're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ according to what you've directed us to do in the word of God in the Bible. And we trust you, Father God, that your word is true, and that yes, we are saved, we are cleansed, we are forgiven. We trust you now in Jesus' precious name. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name again. Amen. Amen. Amen.